Our theme of today's show is curiosity. Uh, but what I want to do first is to tell you a little, some little, a little bit of news uh, surrounding uh, parenting. And uh, we, we did this uh, last show a month ago uh, when uh, there was an article in the New York Times that related to what we had been talking about in the previous show. And so I, I read a little from that article. Well, I found another great parenting article in the New York Times that I would love to share with you. It's on helicopter parenting. Now, these days, helicopter parenting gets a really bad name, and I've always kind of uh, cringed when I've heard people be really disparaging uh, about helicopter parents. I tend to think that it's a reaction, this kind of residual reactions people keep having against anything that seems to want to uh, give more autonomy and freedom to children. Um, and so this article, which talks about some important studies, uh, actually uh, affirms my my belief. So, of course, I always like that. Uh, anyway, um, this uh, pretty much focuses around a book called Love, Money, and Parenting, How Economics Explains the Way We Raise Our Kids. And so up till now, psychologists, sociologists, and journalists have spent more than a decade diagnosing and critiquing the habits of so-called helicopter parents and their school obsessions. They insist that hyper-parenting backfires, creating a generation of stressed-out kids who can't function alone. Parents themselves alternate between feeling guilty, panicked, and ridiculous. But what this new book shows, based on some very uh, well-done studies, uh, the authors say it's true that high-octane, hard-working child-rearing has some pointless excesses, and it doesn't spark joy for parents all the time. But Done right, it works for kids, not just in the United States, but in rich countries around the world. The authors explain that in the 1970s, strict parenting gave way to an era of permissive parenting, going too far the other direction, giving children lots of freedom with little oversight. In the 1980s, however, permissive parenting was replaced by helicopter parenting. So uh, permissive parenting, of course, is not healthy for children. And when people talk about the you know getting away from authoritarian parenting, they're not advocating for permissive parenting. They're advocating for authoritative parenting, which falls in, in between. And, and it seems that helicopter parenting was trying to find some sort of middle ground. Uh, so the, um, the authors go on to say that um, American uh, parents eventually increase their hands-on caregiving by about 12 hours a week. It's not enough just to hover over your kids, however. If you do, it is an authoritarian parent uh, defined as someone who issues directives, expects children to obey, and sometimes... Um, hits those who don't. You, you won't get the full benefits. The most effective parents, according to the authors, are authoritative. They use reasoning to persuade kids to do things that are good for them. Instead of strict obedience, they emphasize adaptability, problem solving and independence, skills that will help their offspring in future workplaces that we can't even imagine yet, because this is relatively new. Um, it says the benefits can be academic, but in addition, a British study, kids raised by authoritative parents reported better health and higher self-esteem. In an American study, they were less likely to use drugs, smoke, or abuse alcohol. They started having sex at older ages, and they were more likely to use condoms. So this is a little thing that jumped out to me. Why wouldn't everyone just become an authoritative parent? Religious people... Quoting here, religious people, regardless of their income, are more likely to be authoritarian parents who expect obedience and believe in corporal punishment. Um, I, I think uh, that, that gives you a, big, a nice big chunk from, from this article, but I think it does reflect a lot of the things we've been saying on this show uh, about the values of authoritative parenting. And just a little side note that I just have to mention from this article, and the last thing I'll say about it is, uh, from this study, it found that respondents who valued self-reliance and creativity in children, staples of both authoritative and permissive uh, par parenting, were more likely to have voted for Hillary Clinton in 2016. Those with more authoritarian views on parenting were more likely to have voted for Donald Trump. Somehow that doesn't seem too surprising. 
Um, so, um, I guess before we jump from this, Dale, is there anything you think to add about that article or some of the points it raised? Uh, well, it um, it crosses into some of my favorite territory. The whole authoritative authoritarian um, uh, dichotomy is has a lot of great research behind it. And as you said, um, authoritative parenting um, has the research on its side. The outcomes are best with authoritative parenting. The labels drive me bananas because they, they pick these two words that are only four letters different. And so <laughs> while I'm in the middle of talking about it, I'm constantly misspeaking and uh, talking about authoritarian when I mean authoritative and, and vice versa. Um, but uh, the article I think is terrific. It's, it's right on the money. And at the same time, it does something that um, makes me crazy, which is, uh, I mean, it's really the headline more than anything. And the use of the term helicopter parenting, because the first thing you have to ask when, you know, if somebody comes up to me and says, do you think helicopter parenting is a good idea? I have to say, what do you mean by that? You know, what do you mean by that? It's like when somebody talks about spirituality, you know, you always have to say, hold on, define, What's your, define it. What do you mean by that? And then we can talk. Mm -hmm. um, it's the same thing with this. If helicopter parenting means this sort of high pressure, anxiety inducing uh, over presence of the parents, that's a bad thing. That's a, that's a verifiably bad thing. But if it's referring as the, as the article appears to be, uh, if it's referring to attentive parenting, you know, uh, parents who are involved in their kids' lives, who are um, uh, hands-on in a positive and productive way, who are being very supportive, um, that is something that the research bears out uh, as being a good thing. So it's just the, the terms can be problematic, uh, but you just have to parse it down a little bit and and uh, figure out uh, what you what uh, is meant by it uh, by everybody in the conversation. And uh, once you do that, this article really, I think, makes excellent points about uh, sort of where we are, not just in the swinging pendulum of things, but in uh, the research. What have we determined actually has the best outcomes for kids? Right. And when everyone initially gets on board with how we're defining terms, then we can always have a more productive conversation. Right. Max, um, do you have any thoughts on how you might have observed your uh, colleagues at school, in high school, um, how, how maybe their different ways that their parents... Uh, interact with them and how you've seen maybe how outcomes from that by the way their kids act or take care of their needs? Yeah, um, I feel like when a parent is too overbearing or too distant from their kids, it really shows in the classroom. Uh, the kids, both of them, are very slow to raise their hands in class. They're very slow to participate in part of the group. They usually have lower confidence and um, are not very energetic in the social environment. Hmm. Um, seeing them interact with their parents, it's very easy to tell when they feel uneasy being with them uh, versus a very supportive parent like my own. Oh. Uh, I'm always very eager to talk about my day talk about you at school. <laughs> you talk about me at school? I do. Oh, I'll have to find out more about that. <laughs> interesting. Uh, very interesting. Wow. Um, okay, well, let's then now jump into uh, this topic of curiosity. And uh, Dale, I think I'm going to hand it to you and to, to talk about this idea. Sure. I'm, I'm actually, I love the fact that we landed on this at this point because by coincidence, my podcast, the Raising Freethinkers podcast, is in the middle of a series on curiosity. So I've been uh, up to my, up to my neck in it, and uh, it's really one of my favorite parenting topics because I it started me in my non-religious parenting work. Um, I've told the story a million times of my son um, who was attending a Lutheran preschool when he was four years old, and uh, one day I asked him, um, Connor, why are you growing so big? You know, just this sort of casual question. And he said, I don't know. I guess God just wants me to grow. And um, I just about fell over, not because of the God part of the answer. It really wasn't that. 
it was the very first time I'd heard him give an incurious reply. It's the first time I ever had heard him uh, give an answer and uh, that essentially wasn't an answer, that basically punted it to somebody else. In this case, it's God. I don't, I don't know and I don't need to know. Uh, and that really got me thinking about how I wanted to be as a parent. Separate from that, um, I reporters, uh, when I do interviews over the years about the, the books, um, every once in a while, a reporter would ask a question that I think is a really interesting question. It makes you think about your parenting. Uh, they would ask, um, if, there was, if there's one thing you could give your kids, one value um, that you could instill in them um, to carry through the rest of their lives, what would it be? And I blew this question for years because I kept uh, not having an answer. I kept saying, oh, you can't boil it down to one thing. There are eight different things. There's, you know, empathy and courage and honesty and openness and generosity and gratitude. I'd, I'd have this whole list of things. And then I'd hang up the phone and I'd go, yeah, I hate that I do that because there should I should be able to say that there's something at the core. There's something that leads to all these things. And for a while, I thought it was critical thinking, right? I want them to be critical thinkers, and I certainly do. Um, I want them to be empathetic. So I would say, well, critical thinking and empathy and happiness. And I'd start with the list again. Um, but I finally realized over time, the curiosity lies at the root of all these other values that I wanted to impart to them. It's, it actually comes before a lot of these values. And having a, one of the things that drives me crazy about the religious worldview frequently is how incurious it is that it just stops asking questions. It becomes satisfied with the first comfortable answer that comes up. Um, so, uh, you know, for example, critical thinking. Um, critical thinking is a set of tools to understand the world, to see the world clearly. But the fact is you don't uh, just want to hand your kids the tools. What you want them to have first is the hunger. You want them to have the desire to see the world clearly. And that's what curiosity is. So if you raise a child from the very beginning, just finding the world fascinating, finding the world something that they want to understand, they want to see clearly, then they say, okay, how can I see it clearly? How can I avoid you know, confirmation bias and all these other things that get in the way? Well, critical thinking is the way, that's the set of tools that serves your curiosity. And even something like empathy, which you would think is completely separate from curiosity. Uh, the fact is that you are not empathetic until you're curious about how someone else feels about what their experience is like. Wow. So that's yet another thing that's rooted in curiosity. You, It's the opposite of fear. Fear is that thing that closes you in. It makes you defensive. It makes you closed off and uninterested in the world. Curiosity is an openness. It's a willingness to engage the world. And it really, I think, is my fundamental parenting value. Wow, that is fascinating. Um, do you have any thoughts just in terms of an academia or you know, when you're wanting to learn new things, like um, what, what do you think parents need to understand about allowing the, that openness to, to, to be there, the open door, so that before trying to teach all these tools and things? Well, I was raised in two households with two different parents, um, one in secular and one was, uh, one is Christian. And I, whenever I had a question, I expressed curiosity in, uh, my religious home, I was always either shut down or given kind of a half answer. Uh, if it was maybe an uncomfortable topic or, uh, a topic that they didn't know, I would just, like, I wouldn't get an answer. I wouldn't, I wasn't told to go research myself. I was just shut down. Versus in um, my secular home, it almost, oh, got a little too much. Uh, like, if I didn't know how to spell a word or I didn't know something, uh, my mom would make sure, drill it into me, that uh, I know and we learn it together. 